This is The Secret Library, a podcast about writing and publishing books. I'm Caroline Donahue, a life coach who works with writers, and I'm here to tell you this is your year. It's time to stop waiting and start writing. The Secret Library podcast is brought to you by listeners like you via The Secret Library podcast Patreon. You can check it out and become a supporter at patreon.com slash secret library. This is episode 135 of the Secret Library podcast. My guest this week is Paul Jarvis. He is the author of Company of One, a maker of software and online courses, and a sarcasm enthusiast. His writing and ideas focus around the contrarian view that business growth isn't always good and isn't always required. He also writes the Sunday Dispatch's weekly newsletter since 2012, and he shares full-length articles on business, life, and creativity. He is super fun, so I am very, very excited to have Paul Jarvis on. I have been following his work for quite some time, and I am really, really interested in the idea that small is mighty. And that is one of the things that I love about his book, Company of One, and our conversation, is basically looking at... Do you really need more? Do we really need bigger, better, louder, larger in order to be happy? In my experience, that hasn't been the case. And so reading Paul Jarvis's book and talking to him about the theory behind his being a solo practitioner and a solo online business owner for much of his career, actually the majority of his career, was super refreshing. And I think that every author is a company of one. So Everyone who writes stands to learn from this conversation. Plus, Paul is just really fun to talk to. So I'm very, very excited to share this conversation with Paul Jarvis. Hey, Paul, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, no, I'm I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to chat today, this morning for me, this evening for you. I know, we're, we're like straddling the opposite edges of a day here which is always an exciting thing. So I'm really excited to talk about Company of One, but also writing in general, which you've done a ton of. And I think it's an interesting thing to approach the topic of Company of One from the angle of a writer and a writer's business. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about what to you being a Company of One means when you're thinking about it as a writer rather than just a business person if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it totally does because I feel like that's kind of what I do for a living at this point is, is writing and <laughs> different different takes on, on whatever that means. Um, so I think what, what a company of one means in, in that specific regard is that I like writing. Like it really comes down to the fact that I like writing. I don't want to promote myself out of a job that I like by becoming like the manager of a writing company. And I mean, the book really looks at if growth isn't um, the if the byproduct of success isn't growth, then what could it be? And I mean, <clears throat> for myself, for uh, for a writer, I, I don't need a big company. Like to be more successful do- as a writer doesn't mean I need to have like offices in like Berlin, Los Angeles, and New York. Like it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense for my business. So why does it need to grow? And I think that that's the case in, in a lot of kinds of businesses, but for, for writing specifically, I think that it it just makes sense to operate the business at, and it's, it's such a, like, I hate the word lifestyle business, but I think that <laughs> it makes like it makes sense, not in terms of like, well, you work 30 minutes a day uh, up from a beach in Thailand with a Mai Tai in one hand and a laptop in the other, because sand and laptop, sand and technology just don't mix. No. And I also I, I don't like some writers write better inebriated. I'm not one of them. I don't even drink. <laughs> So like one drink and I just would not be able to write. So I think that that, but to get back to the the point, I think that every business is a lifestyle business. If you do it right, I think that, or even if you don't, in fact, if you work for a company, if you work for a corporation, if you're working like a, a quote unquote normal job, whatever that is, you have a lifestyle your butt has to be in a chair from nine to five, Monday to Friday, whether or not you have enough to do or not. If you work for like a high growth startup, your lifestyle looks a certain way if you're beholden to like investors. And so I think that if we run our own businesses, which I think a lot of writers do, 
we get to kind of figure out like, okay, what is life that I want? How can I build a business that fosters that instead of building a business and being like, okay, well, this is the life I'm left with. I'd rather approach it from the other end and be like, okay, what's the life that I want? And how can I build a business that works for the life that I want? And then make decisions in that business based not on some preconceived notion of success, which I think are is mostly outdated concepts anyways, but instead make decisions based on like, what the fuck do I like to do <laughs> with my day every day? And like, how can I build a business that really supports, like if I like writing, if I like being by myself in my home office, in my sweatpants and writing most days, what should I say yes to? And what should I say no to in, in terms of business if things are going well? And I mean, that, that to me is like a- accurately like fostering this idea and this mindset from company of one to, to make it work for like um, writing as, as a business, I think. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I have definitely been guilty of kind of putting writing at the end of this kind of long road of of checklists that have to be accomplished before I get to write. It's like, oh, when I have X amount of savings or when I have achieved (laughs) X amount of whatever, or building certain aspects of business that once that's running really well, then I'll be allowed to write when the whole point from the beginning was to write. And Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the things that was really refreshing about your book to remind people is that you don't have to be a gigundo corporation in order to have achieved your goals as a business. In fact, you may completely have a, an impossible time achieving your goals if you try to become a gigundo corporation. Yeah. Even if you try to become a gigundo writer, like I think it's hard and I think you're setting yourself up for failure. If your only level, if your only goal to reach is like the top of writing like, I think it, you're going to be, even if you succeed, you're going to be failing for long because it takes a while. I think, I don't know. I'm definitely not a gigundo writer by any means, but like, <laughs> it's a technical term. I think it, it totally is. But I think if we, if we, if we set, it's so like, I just think that like, if we set our goals a bit lower, <laughs> we're going to be happier sooner. Like totally. I would rather be happier in the present with less than potentially happy in the future only when I achieve certain things, right? Like I would rather just be happy that I can spend my days writing as opposed to hopefully be happy. Like if I make some book list, which doesn't matter anyways, right? Or like if I sell X number of copies, it's so out of our, out of our control anyways, to achieve a lot of these goals. It's just like asking Zoltar or a magic eight ball, like (laughs) for, for goal planning, like, how, how will I get there? I don't know, but this is the thing that I want. I'm not going to be happy until I get there. Well, then you're spending a lot of time being unhappy. For me, I like writing. So I just like, if I get to write the majority of my day, then I'm like, cool, good job. (laughs) Like today was a good day. Like if we separate the, if we separate out and become happy with the process instead of the outcome, I think we're just setting ourselves up for, (laughs) for things just being better. Definitely. I mean, it makes me think, of this scientific study. And of course, I don't remember the source for it, but I will try to dig it up and put it in the show notes where they tested kids um, ability to kind of put off satisfaction. And they were the, the sort of argument was that they'd be better off if they were able to do it. And it was like, here's a marshmallow. And if you don't eat this marshmallow for five minutes or whatever amount of time it was, we'll give you a second marshmallow as well. And very few of the children, of course, were able to stick it out for the second marshmallow. But I think that we have been trained so intensely, like hold out for the second marshmallow, you know, (laughs) that we, we never, I don't even know if they enjoyed the two marshmallows. If they got the two of them, I feel like it's like, it's okay to eat that marshmallow. If you want to eat that marshmallow and maybe you'll get another one. It's okay. You know what I mean? Like it's okay to write now and not be like, well, once you've achieved this entire list, then maybe, maybe you might be allowed to write an article (laughs) or a short story, but don't get ahead of yourself. Yeah. I mean, when I want a job where I'm like testing kids and marshmallows, that kind of sounds fun. Yeah. I don't know why, but it totally sounds fun. But it's like, I told myself that same bullshit story. Like I can't be a writer until I've achieved like X, Y, and Z. And then I was like, 
why am I believing this idiotic story? I'm telling myself like to be a writer, you, you write like that, like that's, that's the start and the finish of it. There's obviously more if you want to make writing, um, like a career, but really like I didn't write for years and years and years because I was like, well, I'm not a writer. And then I'm like, wait a minute. Like the stories we tell ourselves, we believe to be true. And if we're telling ourselves shitty stories, then we're going to be believing things that, that may not be true if we just do one thing. Like if all it takes for me to be a writer, a quote unquote writer is to write, then why not just start writing instead of like, like you said, like waiting till this happens or waiting till that happens. And it's just, I don't know. I, it just seems like a recipe for, for unhappiness. And there's, there's enough things in the world to be unhappy about. Totally. So I'm curious about something in terms of decisions, because you've been writing about this topic about staying small for a really long time. And you've also, I believe, self-published some books about mm -hmm. publishing and other processes, but you chose to go the traditional route for this book. And I'm wondering what your thought process was behind that. Yeah, I mean... I have such a weird thought process. Like, I'm so excited. So I, <laughs> I self-published, I think it was about, I think it was four, four books I self-published. And I mean, they sold, well, I think I sold like 70 or 80,000 copies of my book self-published. So, I mean, like they did all right. That's great. And then, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I'd been bashing traditional publishing, like the years that I had been self-publishing, I had just been like, slagging traditional publishing and being like, I don't understand why you would take less money and end up doing more work in some cases. And then I was like, wait a minute. Like, I can't really, I feel like I do a lot of things so that I, it's just, it's the same reason why I vote. I vote so I can complain later. So I felt like I wanted to traditionally publish. So if I was going to complain about traditional publishing, it would be from actual experience instead of like my perception of, of it as an industry. That's amazing. Which is an awful, <laughs> it's like the worst reason, but it was it's kind of like being honest, it's kind of true. I was also just curious, like I had done it the self-published way. It had worked, um, in as much as it can work or anything can work. And I was just like, well, what happens if I try something different? Like, well, it was really like, it was an experiment to me and it, it's still actually an ongoing experiment, but I've, I've enjoyed the pro like, I'm kind of glad I did. I don't know if I would traditionally publish a second time yet. I mean, ask me six months after the, the book comes out, <laughs> then I might right. have an answer. But for now it's like, I, I see pros and cons to both. I don't think that one is better than the other. And I'm, I'm glad I've done it. I'm glad I've gone this route. This has been super, super interesting and frustrating sometimes too, but I have learned a lot. I've learned what to complain about, which is good, which is really, which is the goal going in, to be honest. So it's like being an informed complainer. <laughs> exactly. I feel like that's my job. As a, the type of writing I do is informed complaints. I so wondered if on, it was something like that. Cause it's <laughs> because, you know, the book is about, you know, staying small, staying in control of the situation, you know, all of these things that I'm like, oh, how interesting. And I know that he's published independently before. So that's fascinating. I'm really excited yeah. about that answer. I have never heard that answer before, but I'm <laughs> really into it. And I think there is something to be gained by doing both and being able to see how they're different and, and how they change the process for you. Yeah. And I mean, this book feels like it's weird because <clears throat> on one hand, I'm advocating for the end of, of big business and I'm working with like, I'm working in the publishing industry, which is for all intents and purposes for right now, who knows in a year or five years, but it is kind of a big business. And it's funny, the frustrations I've had have been around the fact that it's hard to, it's hard to move when you're big, like that's one of the, the main, the main points of the book is that it's really hard to make decisions quickly, to put your customers first, to, to pivot when needed. And I mean, all of these things, I'm like, when my editor and like the people at my publisher are reading this, like, are they considering their jobs? I because... wonder that as I'm reading, I'm like, huh, this is a fairly big publisher. I'm wondering if they're like, Hey, now, as they're reading this book. 
Yeah, I asked. I didn't ask anybody at my American publisher. I asked somebody at my uh, UK publisher, and two of them are going freelancer. They're like, "Yeah, this book was actually really helpful for that." Amazing. I'm like, oh God, don't tell don't tell your boss this because I don't know if she's going to want to publish another one of my books. But yeah, so it's been that part has been super interesting because I, I honestly I don't have that much of a connection to the corporate world. I've worked for myself for twenty years almost, so like my connections to the way that work works isn't are are very thin (laughs) at the moment. So it's good to kind of get that, um, get that insight. It's like you've gone undercover. (laughs) <laughs> but not really because I wrote about Everybody it. Everybody knows. And then shared it with the people that I was undercover with. Yeah. That's the but best kind, kind of yeah, undercover kind of. though. It's like undercover <laughs> in plain sight. Yes, exactly. I don't think I'm smart enough to be undercover, undercover. It's like when I buy my wife presents and I'm like, I'm going to wait for some important event to give her a present. And then I'm like, I just can't even keep this secret anymore. <laughs> I'd be the worst. I'd be the worst spy. I'd like walk into a consulate and be like, yeah, I'm a spy. Hey. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here to spy on you. (laughs) Yeah. That's amazing. (laughs) I wanted to ask you about another sort of myth that you took apart in a way I was really pleased with in the book, which is the myth that you're supposed to follow your passion, which is this piece of advice that everybody's always giving to creative people. And I thought the way you dissected this was really helpful and actually in a way more optimistic than this idea that, oh, you have to follow your passion. Because again, like what if people don't know what that is, which happens all the time, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I've, <clears throat> I've heard that as well. Like it's hard to, it's hard to follow. Like I think passions are great for hobbies. Like if I'm like, I need to be passionate to want to skydive, to jump out of a plane. I wouldn't like in real life, I'm not no, talking about either. myself like, because I would even... never skydive right. but, or like learning ukulele. That's like, I would need to be passionate to like go out and buy a ukulele and learn how to play a ukulele. But when we're talking about like our careers, which take up like a third of our day for our, for our working, um, from like when we're old enough to work to when we're finished working, whenever that is, it's a lot of time. And I feel like all of the things that I've been passionate about in life, like it's a fickle flame. It kind of, <laughs> they, it burns out pretty quick. Whereas when I work towards getting really good at something and I start to learn like the nuances of, of the thing that I'm learning, then I feel like I get more, passionate about it but passion in that case is more of like a s- slow build up and a more sustained burn so even in even with writing like I didn't grow up wanting to be a writer like I think when I was a kid I think I wanted to grow up to be a dinosaur like I just wasn't that's awesome I wasn't thinking about like job stuff um I guess I could be a dinosaur like, that's if a I totally like, achievable a, goal though because all be adults mascot. all adults yeah. ultimately say oh I'm such a dinosaur so you're going to get yeah. there. We're all going to get there. It's it great. I also feel like I'm old man internet. So I think I went from <laughs> like age 18 to age 73 in terms of <laughs> how I how I act and show up in the world. But for passion, I think that it makes more sense to just work at because like you're right. You're like we never know like what we're going to give a shit about later. So why not just work at getting good at things? And I find the more I work at getting good at things, and if I'm excited about getting better and getting better and like iterating on um, my expertise and really mastering a craft, then the more passionate I am about that for the long term. And I mean, all of the things that, and it it also, like you said, it's also very freeing because I don't have to pick a passion and then just run towards that. I can just pick things that I'm interested in and learn about them and get better at them. And over time see like, okay, this is, this is working or, or maybe this isn't working, but I'm not tied to this. My life has no meaning unless I'm like chasing my passion. It's like, I don't know. That just, that's just never resonated with me. I mean, I'm sure it makes a good quote for Instagram over like a picture of somebody sitting on a mountain, Yeah, but I also don't like Instagram. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I like the, because you said craft and you talked about the metaphor of being a craftsperson rather than seeking Mm -hmm. your passion, which I thought was really great because 
I do think that when people have this ideal waved in front of them about pursuing their passion, if they ever have a bad day or a hard time doing the thing, it's almost like, well, now this is disqualified from being my passion. But as we all know, writing is is never something to pursue if you're not willing to have a bad day every now and then or a frustrating experience. And I think the the way you phrased it, I did I don't have the exact phrasing in front of me, but just that that engaging in work will help you develop passion along the way. And that if you're a craftsperson, you're thinking about what the work, what you can do for the work and what you can do with the work for other people, rather than if it's just a passion, it's something like, how's this work going to make me feel? And if it doesn't make me feel good, it's not worth doing. But I, I've never thought that that's true, especially about writing. Yeah, it's also incredibly egocentric. And I don't think that good writers can be completely egocentric. Obviously, some ego is needed. But like if the if, you, if your sole purpose for the work is your own gratification, then again, hobby, because if it's if you're doing this for an audience, then you have to include them in it. Otherwise, it's not going to be it's not, it's, it's going to fall flat. It's just like in business. If you don't consider your customers, if you're just doing the business to do, to just serve you and your purposes, people pick up on that. Like people don't like, people aren't interested in that. Like it, business is servitude. So unless you're considering serving somebody else with your writing, with your business, with anything, then it just doesn't really, it just doesn't make sense to me. No, definitely not. I mean, I think it's, it's also helpful in another way, which I think if you're thinking about it as a craftsperson, then it, it isn't so much about ego. It's more about really dedicating the process to doing it well. But I also Mm -hmm. think that if you're thinking as a craftsperson, who's going to serve other people with the piece that you're creating, then you're able to think more about them. And it, it helps, at least it helps me get past any kind of active terror that comes up of like, Oh my God, I'm putting this thing out there and everyone might shred it and, you know, shit on it or whatever. And I'm going to have to deal with that. Um, but if there's this other impression of like, well, I've, I've worked on this and I've worked to improve it and I'm hoping that it'll be of some benefit, then that can really help. For sure. And I also think that like, as soon as we release anything into the world, it's kind of not ours anymore. Like we no longer hold sole ownership over it. So it's like if I write a piece and share it with a thousand people, every single person is going to interpret it differently based on like their life experiences, what they think I mean, even if I think I'm spelling it out very clearly, like people are going to interpret whatever we do in whatever way suits them and their life and the story they're telling themselves. And it is kind of freeing. Um, if we consider that because then it's not like it's not ours. And if there's an issue with it, then it's not, solely our issue it's the other person like maybe they were going through some things and that's why they hate it or that's why they think they now hate us and it's like in shared ownership there's also shared responsibility and then it takes the weight entirely off of our shoulders like yeah we're still responsible for the work we put out into the world but we're not solely responsible for how it's interpreted which I, i for me as well i think that that's um incredibly freeing because it's not just, it's not just on me anymore. It's like some other people own it and that's good. And that's, that's a a benefit (laughs) to, to how I deal with things, even, especially if it's criticism where people can, if they have a problem with it, I can sometimes see that like, yeah, this isn't even like, I'm just the person that happened to be like in their inbox or on their Kindle at the time when they're dealing with some shit. And that's fine. If, if I've helped them in some way, great. If I haven't helped them, then that sucks, but hopefully something else will help them. Right. You've just created some sort of catharsis even. It's entirely yeah, yeah. possible. <laughs> yes. Well, this adds something as well that I was excited about. And part of it was the phrase I told you beforehand. I was really thrilled with the phrase excitable nerd that you used in the book to describe <laughs> yourself, because I think many of us listening can relate to this. Um, But I think also the idea that in order to write well, that there is this kind of urge that we have in particularly, I think, in nonfiction to present a kind of professional veneer and to appear as a certain kind of person with a certain kind of expertise and level of ability in order to warrant the title of, you know, author or whatever Hmm. else we're putting on. And I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about writing from 
the perspective of actually writing as yourself and how that's been, and also dealing with the other things that go along with creating a book. As you said before we started recording, that sometimes the ideal of being up in a cabin and those of us who are fairly introverted really enjoy that ideal, but unfortunately it goes away when your book does well. Um, how you handle both writing and the other parts of book authorship as yourself. Yeah. I mean, Small I don't question. think I'm, yeah, I don't think, and I may need a refresher when I get past the first part for, no this, problem. <laughs> for the second part, but I, I like, I don't think I'm smart enough to be somebody else in my writing. Like, I don't know. I have no writing like train as funny. Like when my public, like that, you get an author questionnaire when you're working with a publisher and they're like, talk about your like schooling and the alumni organizations you're part of. And I'm like, I went to high school. <laughs> like that's about it. And they're like, list your awards and accolades. I'm like, I have zero of these things. Amazing. But like, I just, I don't know. Like, I feel like it's easier to just be yourself in your writing, but much scarier. Mm. So it's, it's easier to present yourself as yourself, but none of us want to do that by default because then we're, we're removing a layer that some people have where if somebody's not going to like my writing and I presented myself as, as a different person or a more professional or expert person, then they're not disliking the real me. They're disliking this person that I've been playing Right. And that seems like it could be potentially easier to deal with. Whereas if you are honest and vulnerable and you in your writing, then if somebody doesn't like it, then they don't like you. And that sucks when somebody doesn't like you. And I know because a lot of people don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> it is just kind of the way that it's worked out in life. But I, do, I also think that it also doesn't like it doesn't matter. Like, I'm some weird dude who's like tattooed from my neck to my toes and I've like have no like actual business accreditations at all. But I've written a bunch on business and I've written a, the company one, which is kind of a business book. Um, and it doesn't like I still have like I've worked for myself for 20 years. Like I still have experience. A lot of the book is, is research as well. So it doesn't even matter the experience that I have. I've just got good at reading reports. <laughs> so I just think that like it's but it also doesn't matter. Like even like when I was talking to like when I was looking for uh, an agent or when we were shopping the book to, to publishers, like they don't like that it doesn't matter. Like I don't, and I told like the publicist that I'm working with, I'm like, I don't own it. She's like talking about TV stuff. And I'm like, first of all, no TV. And second, <laughs> I don't want to do that. But second, it's like, I don't own like, cause she was talking about like, Oh, we could get on like these financial shows and stuff. I'm like, dude, I don't even own a suit. Like I don't care about the way business is supposed to work. I care more about like doing it in the way that works for me and I mean, that's kind of how I approach writing as well is like, I, I most business books are fucking boring. It's right. like, I don't care. Like I would, ra like I would have left to my own devices. I'm reading sci-fi. Like totally. that is, that is my, that is my, that is my favorite place to exist in when I'm reading and I read a lot. And so like, I don't care if my book sounds like a business book or reads like a business book because who cares? Like, what does it matter? It, it, it's the way things have been done uh, for the most part. But like, I don't seem like a business person. I just happen to run a business. I don't need to seem like a business writer. I just need to seem like me. And it's it's easier, but scarier <laughs> to do that. But it's also like I, I'm also afraid of pretty much everything. So I learned early on with anything I did that like action can exist it, it, in parallel with fear, like I can be scared of something and just do it anyways. And I'm probably not going to die. I think it was, um, <laughs> Oliver Bergman's the antidote, um, which is a really good book. And that's not, that's not a business book either. So it's, it's, it's well-written. Um, <laughs> and he talks about how like mo we're, we're very, like we let fear kind of lead our decision making when really like the things that we should be afraid of are like, Die, like if I'm not going to die an embarrassing death by making a choice in my life that I'm scared of is really not going to make that big of a difference. True. Like, 
it's just not going to make that big of a difference. And most people don't pay. The other thing is that most people just don't pay attention to to like other people. Like everybody's wrapped up in their own shit. So like, even if you do something that's embarrassing, like people are either not going to notice or they're going to notice for like a millisecond and then be consumed by their own shit again, like a millisecond later. So even if you make decisions that, that lead to, like badness or or embarrassment nobody's gonna nobody cares as much as you do about that stuff anyway so it's not even that big of a deal i've totally gone off on a tangent now no, and i'm I so into the it second <laughs> i forgot the second half of the question well you, you kind of answered it but i will okay. i will bring it up again just to make sure there isn't anything more because this is really good i I'm wondering how you continue to be yourself in the parts of the book. I think in some ways for, at least for introverted types, it's fairly easy to be yourself as a writer when you're in a room by yourself in the (laughs) aforementioned sweatpants typing away, that feels great. But when you're, you know, being interviewed, having to write up things, talk to people, you've mentioned you rejected television, but even though I'm like desperate to see you on a financial show in (laughs) those self same sweatpants so much, but, um, I understand your desire not to do it, but I'm going to enjoy (laughs) the image for myself. Um, how do you reconcile this sort of yourself and this, you know, the fearful stuff and then having to deal with being an author who has to do certain stuff as, you know, having published a book? Yeah. I mean, I just kind of figure that like for, for opportunities that are presented to me there, like I wouldn't like if, if, if it was television or even if it was like radio or or podcasts or stuff like that, I wouldn't be in the situation of like being on the show or being interviewed or doing the thing if they didn't value my expertise and valuing expertise doesn't go hand in hand with like, professionalism or like being seen as an expert. Like if I'm going to go and I've done some financial podcasts with some super businessy types and like, I still talk the way that I do, which is mostly like a surfer (laughs) for some reason. (laughs) And like, it just doesn't, I just like, if they're wanting to talk to me, then they're wanting to talk to me, not like professional Paul like, I don't know who that guy is. He's probably a dick. Maybe. I don't <laughs> like, know. I don't even know. But like, I just like, I, and to bring it back to um, your description from my description of myself is just like, I've always been an excitable nerd. Like, I don't know how to operate on a level that isn't excitable nerd. Like, and even with my publicists, like we went through a bit of like media training and stuff like that. And I'm like, these is like, this is interesting to consider and, and things like bridging conversations or bringing like conversations back to a topic or being careful not to use like negative words or say that you don't know something. And I'm like, Oh shit. I say, I don't know. Most things. like most questions <laughs> are like, I, I don't actually know. Or the, the data sample set is, is too small. Like if it's just like, and of one, like my own life experience and it's not really a valid data set, like it's too small a sample size. And so like I say, I don't know all the time. I'm like reading through all of the things that like I'm not supposed to do. I'm like, why are you describing me? Oh no. <laughs> With, like all the bad things. And I just, and I talk to her and I'm like, how about if I, how about if I am this way? Like, what if the opposite happens? And she's like, it, it might just work for you. I'm like, all right. And it's funny. Like, I don't know. I feel like most things in my life, people have been like, that's a bad idea or like you're going to regret it later or like, I don't think you're being smart. And I'm always just like, probably not. Like I know me and I'm not that smart. And like, I make bad decisions all the time, but I also think that like time will tell. Like when I, when I dropped out, I did go to university for, for a year. When I dropped out of university, I had to talk to the Dean and he was like, two things are going to happen here now that now that you want to leave Mr. Young Mr. Jarvis. The first is that um, you're going to regret your decision. And the second is that you're going to be back, but you're going to be older and have wasted all that time in between. And I'm like, okay, dude, I probably called him dude because we've already established this is just the way that I talk to people <laughs> <laughs> like a surfer. But I was like, okay, like, 
it does but like what does what does it matter and like you're you don't really know that this is the answer this is the answer that you think is true which makes sense for you because you're the dean of the fucking program so you obviously think that this is a legitimate thing to do or you're just doing it for work which i don't think he was because he really liked he really liked computer science and artificial intelligence but like that was just hit like he thought because his like data sample set for success was that if you're going to do computer sciencey things because that's what I was in school for then you needed a computer science degree from a repre- from a reputable university and I was like I this might not be the case like I feel like most things in my life most decisions I make are just like I'm just going to choose the opposite I'm just going to prove people wrong hopefully maybe we'll see and like that's just kind of the way things go and even with like being a, a quote unquote business author, it's like, I don't look like other business authors. I don't act or talk like other business authors, but like, what if this works? I don't know. It, it may, it may actually not, but it might. It's looking we'll pretty see. good so far. I mean, I, I, I think love so. This. I mean, <laughs> I didn't think that I was going to find a lit agent to represent me um, for the, cause I came with the book idea and I'm like, this is a book I'm writing like, yeah, in or you're not in. And then when she was shopping it around, I was like, I don't know if I, tradi- if like a traditional publisher is going to want like to put this on their imprint or whatever. And I was like, okay, there's actually a bunch that want Like there's a bunch of editors that want to have a conversation with me to, to publish this book. And so at every step I've just been like, I'm actually really surprised that this is happening the way that it is. And then it, it works and it's, it's, it'll work until it doesn't work. And whatever happens is, is fine. Like I can, I can always go back to self-publishing cause I actually really enjoyed that. Or I can just do something different that I'll build up a skill for, become, develop my like craftspersonship about it and then go from there and whatever happens, happens. I'm not Zoltar. I have no crystal ball or anything like that. Maybe you could <laughs> develop that. I could. I'm sure. I'm sure there's an app on the App Store that actually is like Zoltar, the the fortune teller. Oh, I need to go find that now. <laughs> if it's there, we'll link to it. That's so exciting. I mean, I think this is like something that I've said to clients a lot is that people will often slow down and stop writing when they get scared. And they'll think, oh, this is a really bad idea. This seems really scary, putting this story out there, finishing this story, finishing this book, like insert whatever, fill in the blank. But what I've determined is that if you're not freaked out a little bit, it just means that there's no skin in the game. Like you don't get scared when you're like, you know what? I think I'm going to go around the corner and like pick something up from the shop for dinner. Like that does not, at least for me, instill fear, nor most people I know, is that the case? But as soon as you start doing something that's going to shake the status quo, then it does get scary. So I've gotten to the point where if, if something is scary to me, I just assume I'm on the right track. Yep. I mean, every, like I, I write an article a week for my mailing list. Every time I'm scared of an article or every time I'm like, this is not going to go well. Like I'm going to send this out and it's just not going to go well. Or I'm scared to send this. or I don't want people to know this, or this is a wacky. I like, even when I wrote about like the book came from a, an article that I wrote, I think called something like, I don't actually care about growth. And I'm like, this is just me being a weirdo in business and nobody's going to get it. And that's fine. And then I published it. And then that was like the most popular article for um, two years ago, that I wrote two years ago. Even the, the article that most pe- the article that most people remember, and I'm curious if you remember this or not, or have even read it or not, was an article that I wrote that I was most scared of publishing because I'm like, this, this does, isn't even going to make sense to other people. And it was an article about my pet rats. It yes, was called I something know it. like Find Your Rat People. That is like the the calling card of me as a writer, because that's the thing that everybody, and this was, I probably published that like five or six years ago, Yeah, a while but that's ago. still, that's the one, if people remember one thing from me, it's that article. And that was the one that I was most scared of, of writing and, and then hitting publish on. Totally. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I think that's true. It's like as much as people can be like, okay, this is scary. The thing that I've noticed though, is that my critic has figured this out because I keep telling people this, like, you know what, if you get scared, that means it's good. And my inner (laughs) critic is like, oh, damn it. She's figured it out. She knows. (laughs) So now I've noticed what happens is I get incredibly sleepy 
instead. When I'm writing something a little scary, and I'm like, oh, I really got to take a nap. I don't know. I really got to take a nap. And I'm like, oh, this is so much harder to fight through. If something seems scary, I can just keep going. But if I'm falling asleep, it's so much harder. (laughs) Yeah. Creative work is just such a tricky beast. It's like we, we tell us like, we just find anything to, to get away from it, even though it's what we know we want to do. It's just a weird dichotomy of like human condition weirdness, I think. It totally is. I don't understand half of what we do. It's so bizarre. It's like we're simultaneously, like you're talking about with the the newsletter or anything else, we're simultaneously like actively terrified that no one will read the thing that we're writing. And then we're simultaneously terrified that someone will read it before we're ready. Like at the same time, same piece of writing. Yeah, I'm equally, I'm as scared of success as I am of failure. Like it's it's basically 50-50 for me. It's like, oh shit, what if this does well? And oh shit, what if this tanks? It's the same, like it's the same level for me. Exactly. Amazing. So you, you've got a little bit of time before the book comes out, not much, but how are you feeling? Are you ready? Are you ready for this thing to launch? Um, it's funny cause so I finished writing it. I'll have finished writing Like the day that it comes out, I finished writing it and submitted, submitted the manuscript 18 months prior to that. And at that time I was like, this sucks that there is so much time. Like, why didn't I just self publish? This sucks that I have to wait so long. And then as it inches closer and closer to the launch date, I'm like, oh, I wish there was more time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. There's like, there's like not enough time to do all of the things that I want to do. And it's funny because like a lot of people were like, how did you feel when you finished, when you like submitted the the manuscript? I'm like, stressed out that I still had so fucking much to do. Like that's only like when you're right, when you're writing for a living, like finishing the book is cool and it should be celebrated, I think, or maybe other <laughs> people celebrate it. But like it, it's, it, you, it kind of marks like the halfway marker right. of like the actual work that's required. So right now, like, it is kind of stressful, to be honest, because the the part of writing that I really, really like is the writing part. Yep. <laughs> like the sitting, like I do actually live in the woods in the middle of nowhere on an island. And like, that's purposeful. Like I didn't just end up here. <laughs> it was like, I, I purposefully made the move from a big city to, to here. But I also know that like, and it's funny that like I had a little mini retreat with two other um, writer friends yesterday. And it's like, we were talking about like this, uh, the idyllic life uh, of a writer. And we basically came to the conclusion that like, yeah, if you're an unsuccessful writer, you can have that life. You can have that life forever where you don't have to talk to anybody and just sit there and write in silence and, and not have to deal with anybody like throwing it up uh, with Wi-Fi, I guess in the middle of nowhere. But like, if you want this to be your job, or if you want to be like a writer for a living, that's at best half of it. Right. (laughs) It's like a cycle. (laughs) You like have part of the time where you're in that and then the other time where you're in basically the opposite of it. Yeah. And I mean, right now, like I am so ridiculously introverted and right now is like promotion. Yeah. It's like I talk on the phone and if I'm not talking on the phone, I just finished up um, the audio book. So I was in the studio recording that and that took probably five days, non-consecutive, thankfully, because my voice would not have lasted five consecutive days of narrating. Um, but That's yeah, like lot. it's. Yeah. And it's exhausting. Like, ta- like I love doing interviews. I love talking to people. I mean, it, it's fun to talk to interesting people. Like it's like, I'm introverted, but I, I'm also not a sociopath. Like I do enjoy the company of others. And so that's good, but it also is draining. And so like, I know, like I, if I do more than three interviews a day, like that fourth interview or fifth interview would just be awful. Like I just would not have the brain power to continue. Or if I did interviews five days a week, I would not have the the capacity to do anything else. So I only do, I don't do any calls or communication with other human beings Mondays and Fridays. 
because I like to still have days where I can just focus on the, the work at the work that I need to do. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday right now is like three interviews a day from like I started in mid September and that's going to continue on until probably March or so with the book, uh, coming out in January. And that's just part of it. Like that's part of this part of the cycle, like you said, and like, it doesn't, it's not easier because I have a publisher and, and them behind me. Like I, I'm still doing the work either way. Like I'm still doing the interviews. I'm still like writing articles. I'm still setting up like giveaways. Like I'm so, it's basically like, it's launching a product. Yep. And I mean, I'm lucky that I basically launch products for a living with the other work that I do. So I understand that there's like quite a bit, like you don't just say like, Hey, everyone, my book is on Amazon one time. And you're like, I launched my book. Hooray. Right. It's like, there's so much more involved and that's part of it. And I know that there's like five, six months of that. And then after that, there'll be five, six months where I disappear again and probably write another book or, or do something else or just like watch Netflix. <laughs> for yeah, that sounds good too. Yeah. So like, I know that it, 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 it it's a cycle and it, it, that's part of like, I like to make money as a writer and I like to like writing is my job now. So I know that that's part of it. And I know that even on days when, like, like we talked about earlier, like even on days when I'm stressed out and I'm like, shit, this is the worst. I'm like, I have more days where I'm like, this is the best <laughs> than like, holy shit, I'm so stressed out that it, 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 it does make it worth it. Like I don't have to enjoy the trappings of my work to enjoy my work. I can enjoy my work as a whole with some times where it's just like, oh my God, like I've taken on too much for the most part when I'm stressed out is because I've taken on too much and I don't like to be busy as my default state. <laughs> so no. when that happens, I'm like, I, yeah, I, I've, I've fucked up. I need to be aware of that. I need to be present in the fact that I've fucked up right now and it's not going to last forever. And I can learn from that. Hopefully if it's me, I, I'll learn from that in three or four of doing the same thing wrong. And then I can, I can iterate and, and adjust as necessary, hopefully, eventually. <laughs> awesome. Well, I want to thank you so, so much for talking to us about the book and your process and all of that. It's, it's been really awesome. And I know all the excitable nerds out there will, will thank you for being yourself as you wrote this <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, thank you very much. This is a, this is a fun conversation. So I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Secret Library podcast. The show is produced by me, Caroline Donahue, and Frederick Barry McWilliams Jr., my tireless audio engineer. To get show notes for this episode and all other episodes, please visit secretlibrarypodcast.com. To get updates, literary love, and notification when new episodes are posted, sign up there for Footnotes, my newsletter. And to learn about life coaching with me to work on building your writing life, visit carolinedonahue.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend. Gold stars to everybody who leaves a rating and review on iTunes. We're so grateful. Until next time, happy reading.